like we've talked about, there's lots of different um, platforms, and we'll look at that. Then we'll look at some sele uh, selection criteria for the drone with the focus on LiDAR. Um, you know, because you can get on online, I think people who read the article, um, hopefully before we came here, um, you know, you, your selection for, for a drone for, let's say, inspection or logistics or taking pictures of the top of somebody's house is vastly different than, you know, using a direct guided uh, inertial sensor and an active uh, modality. So, so we'll look at that. And then, you know, I'm going to go through a couple use cases briefly just to show you and kind of tie this all together on when you'd use a drone, what characteristics we were looking for, and, and really what was involved or what was the value. All right. So first thing, uh, UAV LiDAR, and, and when do you really want to use a drone? If it'll let me click here. <laughs> all right. So the biggest thing, you know, if we look at this, like I was talking about, there's, there's lots of different platforms you could use. I mean, the earliest creation of this stuff was via satellite. Um, you know, whether we're using it for NASA or for here for land exploration or global mapping, you know, and it really wasn't until the late 90s that we saw aerial platforms start to come out. Um, you know, and then the drone did emerge, but before that we had static. And what I want to impress upon you here, you know, when we're looking at deciding whether we want to use a drone is first off, how much of the coverage area can we really cover? And typically speaking, when we look at coverage area for a drone, you know, we're, we're limited usually by a couple things. First off would be uh, the regulations. And we'll talk about that here in a few minutes, but everybody knows that a small drone has to be within, at least for the current visual line of sight, unless you're doing some really awesome legal stuff. Um, like setting up restricted airspace. Um, you know, the second place thing that people don't think about is what is the communication tether to the drone? So the current drones in the, in the commercial market are, are regulated really by what a Wi-Fi signal can be, and that's an FCC regulation. So you're really looking at five to eight kilometers uh, of range that you could actually control the drone, unless you're using something way more uh, exotic, um, but that wouldn't be commonplace in the market. So the folks that are going out and, uh, and buying their DJI drone or uh, something like that, you know, that's about the range that you're dealing with. Um, yeah, and then the last part would be, you know, the, uh, the power source. And so right now, most batteries are gonna get you 20 minutes of flight time. So what we're trying to show you here, at least on the coverage area portion of that, that you know, for the areas that you're going to cover, you're, you're probably going to cover somewhere between 20 and 100 acres per flight, depending on, on what you're doing. Um, and that's the sweet spot that you're going to be sitting in. Now, things are opening up in the market. And what I mean by that is, you know, with Amazon and their lawyers coming in and UPS and some big money entering the space in the logistics area, um, that's forcing the FA function to, to really accelerate their their regulatory rulemaking and with that i would say within the next five to six years you'll see drones moving beyond line of sight at least with a single operator um so yeah so that's so that's why we have that dotted white line but you notice that there's a place for aerial there's a place for satellite and then there's a place for drone um, the second port i want to talk about is on the lower half here when we talk about resolution um, and I think I have a slide a little farther along, but the, the thing when we look at resolution, you know, satellites can get you a certain amount of resolution. Aerial can get you a certain amount of resolution. And, and I'm not going to get too much into, you know, why it's not greater or less. Um, it mostly has to do a lot with physics. But with the drone, you're a lot closer to the ground. So a lot of the effects that are going to affect aerial, you know, and, um, like atmospherics and, and aerosols and that don't really apply or aren't really much of an impact. Plus the dispersion or the beam divergence, you know, and the angular measurement of a sensor are, are a lot smaller. So you can get a lot more density, but you're also going to cover less area while you do it. Um, 
So with this, you know, we have a balance and, and I want to kind of compare that the drone really fits in between the large coverage area of an aerial sensor, like a helicopter, um, and really a static, where the static, you can get tremendous point density, you can get tremendous accuracy, but you can do that because it sits there for a long period of time and covers a finite area. Uh, where the drone will get you decent, uh, decent accuracy, um, but since it is closer, you're gonna get resolution. So as you start to move out in the market, I think you're gonna see more drones um, as that technology uh, matures and we see, find more use cases for it. And so that's where that kind of sits. Uh, does that make sense? Okay. So when we look at, you know, this is more of a summary, kind of recapping what I just talked about. But again, we have lots of different modalities here. And when you look at this, again, the lower you go, the more resolution you're gonna get, uh, but the higher you go, the more area that you can cover. And, and that'll be important when we talk about different use cases because you know, in the UAS market, you know, if you're in the commercial sector, you're always trading off what your field case is versus how much data fidelity that you're going to have. Um, and I'll talk more about that here briefly, but so every chance I get, you know, if the data requirement or the product data requirement supports it, I'm gonna to try to fly higher. I'm gonna to try to fly faster. Um, and so that's the point of what this slide is I'm gonna leave you for. Um, and if it doesn't, if I can't do it, then I'm going to look at a helicopter or an aircraft to, to meet those, uh, those data requirement needs. And we do, we do quite often. All right. So looking at this from the, you know, as one last recap here, I'm gonna kind of break out strengths and weaknesses a little bit and put the drone really in the middle. And what you're looking here, mostly of why you'd use a drone especially for a lot of the products today is, um, you know, usually 10 acres or less is, is what I'm seeing for a lot of the engineering cases. Um, you know, you're doing small areas, it's, it's highly, highly convenient, um, you know, but for the larger cases, so, so if you want a thousand acres or something like that done, um, if you're gonna do that kind of large project, it's because they really want the high density, um, you know, it's not so much that it's efficient as much as they want, let's say, doing something like um, uh, ladder fuel modeling. So if you're doing a burn map and you wanna see the characteristics under the vegetation to see how much biomass you're dealing with, uh, that would be a, a good case. Um, a lot of right-of-ways are now getting into, you know, what kind of uh, geomorphology that they're seeing. Um, so if you need that really, really high density and you, you can't wait around for it, this is when you kind of look at, at drone LIDAR. Now I'd like to compare it a little bit to the terrestrial here, because it's something that we get asked for a lot is, well, can you, can you scan, let's say, um, a dam or, or a levee? And you know, the answer is always yes, but the thing is, what's the data requirement that's going to allow that? If you're looking for something in the millimeter range, and I'll have a breakout of the, the different sensors here shortly, um, a mobile LiDAR system is not going to have the fidelity to see that. If you want to model the dam, then, then it will. And so knowing when to use which one um, and use those efficiencies is kind of important. All right. All right. So that kind of covers the first part of this. And now we're gonna go into more, now that we know the different platforms holistically, I kind of want to bore down now more into the, the LiDAR drone and, and the criteria for selecting your project. So in here, you know, and I briefly touched on it in the last section, but the big thing is where do you start? Um, it isn't what most people in the market do. Most people in the market come to me and they say, hey, I saw your product. Um, I don't know what I'm going to use it for, but I want the big drone and I want the most expensive sensor. Um, let's go do this. And then I, I quote them the price and, and all of a sudden everything stops. And what I sit down and I actually talk to a client, the first thing I, I, I tell them is what is your product requirements? So, you know, you know, a lot of folks don't take the time to say, Hey, what am I actually going to achieve uh, with this? You know, and that's, that's more in the business side of the house. If they had actually talked to their, their data guys that they would probably be a little different, but 
you know, the first thing you want to know is what product are you going to make and what resolution does it need to be? Um, and then from there, we'd actually walk back to, okay, now that I know what the product has to be, what can I actually process at? And then I go back to what can I capture at? And then I go back to how am I going to do it? So you really want to have a backwards approach when you're actually selecting the drone. Um, and so some of the things I'm going to lead somebody to first off is, you know, what work have you already done? And if they have not done work, then I'm going to send them to different online federal sources that show the different um, uh, statements of work out there on the market that, you know, give a, a baseline or a trend. And there are some statements of work that actually have drones now in them, which is kind of great. But if you can't find that, then we go to, first we'll go to aerial light over the helicopter because a lot of that's going to be very similar based on how you're flying, just the sensor is heavier. Um, and then we'll go to, to regular aerial. So a lot, again, a lot of this is not new. Um, and we're just changing the platform and the sensors a little less, has a little less fidelity than, than a regular aircraft model. You know, the other place that we'll send them to is, is data standards. Um, and a lot of folks don't really, <laughs> as surprising as may be, a lot of folks don't really know where to find data standards um, in the market. So, you know, whether they go to, they send them to ASPERS or UGCS or the USDA or FEMA, there, there's tons of different standards out there. Um, you know, of course I have my preferences, but the biggest thing is what does, what does your industry support, you know, in that model, you know, in addition to, you know, the big ones on the federal scale, you know, then each state is also going to have their, um, their lighter standards. So the, the study that I met Cossum through was, uh, was for the state of California, the department of transportation, where we did a four model and you'll actually see that data in your, um, in your assignment, we actually took four UAV LIDARs onto a calibrated range and put the data side by side to see, you know, what was actually effective and what was not, and what actually met standard or what standard it would be. So, you know, again, we have the states actually defining, you know, what the mobile LIDAR is gonna be. And now we're actually starting to see, uh, I think Colorado was first, uh, we're seeing California, I think New York are all defining their UAS uh, lighter standards. So that's another place you're gonna to wanna to look before you actually start to decide on what, uh, what platform you're gonna to wanna to carry. Excuse me. So the next thing obviously as we walk back would be the sensors. And so there's a lot of options um, on the market. Here's a few of the products that, that we carry. Um, and there's a few more. Um, and there's tons and tons of different manufacturers. For, for this discussion, I'm gonna stay just within the realms of the lighter head. Um, I'm not gonna get into the, the geospatial or the INS solution that goes along with it. Uh, each manufacturer is a little bit different as far as what they offer. Uh, but in the essence, you know, it, it's all gonna be about the same when you look at the data. It's just a matter of how you get there uh, and, and what, what you feel comfortable with. Um, but if we look at this setup, I'm not gonna really talk about the puck, the, uh, or the M200 puck, it's really the same thing as the VLP-16. But what we're looking at here, um, still a very light, capable sensor. Uh, you're looking at, relatively speaking, about five to six centimeters of, of relative accuracy. Um, so that's before we actually try to get absolute. Um, and then you look at the ideal altitude that this is gonna fly at. And so something we're gonna point out when we look at these is I would say for all the Velodynes, and I didn't even put a quantity up here, but um, you know, these are automotive sensors and primarily they're there to detect objects and, and to allow you know, LIDAR object-based computing. Um, however, they do have a purpose in the mapping realm, and that's why we use them. I mean, they're affordable, um, you know, when we're in the market, um, they're light, so they're perfect for a drone, um, and they can handle probably about 75% of, of the common use cases out there on the market, depending on the level of vegetation. So we look at this though, you know, because it's an automotive sensor, um, 
you know, they say that the max range is about 100 to, to 80 meters on this chart. And really, we find the ideal somewhere between 40 and, and 50 meters. So that's kind of dead center on the chart here. If you look at it, I think if you can see my mouse, we're right about here. Um, then we look at point density. You know, we're looking at 250,000 points per second. And that's, that's kind of important, you know, for its mount because that's going to tell you what you're able to actually see depending on your altitude. And I'll talk a little bit about that here in a few minutes. Um, and then we get into, um, yeah, and so we have that. And then moving on, we'll have the other Velodyne here, which is the HDL32. And the difference between the 16 and the 32 is the amount of LED sensors in here. Um, so this is a spinning drum essentially with a with 16 or 32 uh, light emitting diodes, and then they have a collector in the middle. And so the concept here is you're putting out more energy across a spread. Um, and so you're, you're laying out a uniform pattern. Consequently, it allows you to have less shadow on one pass. And that's, and that's why they use this different technique. Uh, other than that, the difference between the 16 and the 32 are, are minimal, very, very little. Um, you know, the, the, six or the 32 sensor will get you more points, somewhere around 800,000. And that tends to be why people would use it um, because it gives you a great image, um, especially for road work or if you're trying to pick up um, uh, features on a building or something like that. So very popular sensor, fairly affordable in the LiDAR market, um, you know, and it has its place. Now we move into the Regal products. The Regal products are different. First off, they're built, made from the ground up to be a, uh, a survey platform. Excuse me. So with that, um, instead of using discrete or light emitting diodes, we're now using uh, continuous wave mirrors. Um, so, you know, so the fidelity is gonna be a little bit different. Uh, it is more accurate. So you're looking at a relative accuracy of about 15 millimeters, for, at least for the mini bucks here. They're a little heavier, so we'll cover later that you're not going to get quite the same amount of um, uh, flight time. But with that, you know, you're going to get an accuracy of roughly about three to four centimeters, uh, depending on how well you do your control. And then again, your point density is about 100,000. But I think the big thing that differentiates, you know, the, so the, in addition to the relative accuracy, I think the big thing that's going to differentiate uh, the Velodyne systems and, and the Regal systems is the amount of returns. And what we'll cover here, which you will see um, when you look at the data and you start to look at it from a side perspective, uh, the number of returns is going to help you deal with vegetation. So the more vegetation that you're going to be dealing with, uh, the more returns that you're going to want. And so that's just a general guideline, um, no matter what LiDAR sensor you're using, but particularly if you're using UAV LiDAR. Um, and then we get into the higher boxes where, you know, where you can get down to 10 and five relative meter, uh, centimeters of, uh, or sorry, millimeters of accuracy. Um, you know, and then depending on your control, you can get, you can get below two centimeters, but um, yeah, that's what you're dealing with there. So this is kind of a quick summary and then I promised Karen to kind of talk a little bit about pricing because this, is, when you look at your projects or you look at the point clouds that we are, we're going to give you, one of the things you want to evaluate, um, if everybody could have their way, they're going to want the top of the label Bucks 1HA, but not very many people have $270,000 to go do a project or they may not be able to do it. They may not have enough work to actually pay for that sensor. And so that's why knowing your data is, is really important. Where typically, you know, if you're dealing with like a Velodyne sensor, you're going to be somewhere between 50 and uh, 70,000. Uh, an HDL32, you're going to be somewhere around probably 110 to 140. Uh, a mini box is going to be somewhere around 225 to one, I mean, sorry, 125 to 160. Um, and then a VUX one will be about 225 to 250. And, and same thing with the HA goes up to about 270. Um, so that gives you kind of a ballpark that, you know, these things are not cheap. <laughs> so when you're selecting these for your companies, 
you know, you obviously your ROI or your return on investment is going to be very important. And knowing, you know, what you can get away with with a more affordable sensor um, is really the name of the game. And not to mention when you start to go up, you know, the HA, you can put it on a, a M600, but then you can only put two in supply time. So if you really look at that, um, and you're going to spend that much on the sensor, that's going to be a return on investment for such a small light time. So did that. Um, did, did his audio just go all crazy for everybody or just for me? No, that was pretty interesting. Yep. The, you guys can uh, all hear me? Yeah. We can, yeah. Now we can, yeah. Wicked distortion there for a minute. When did I drop off? Uh, mm -hmm. like, like the last couple sentences. Yeah. Okay. So I, I think just to recap, what I was talking about there was the economics. And, you know, as a, as a really quick summary, you know, everybody will want, you know, the best sensor on the market. Well, if the best sensor is $270,000, and that's not including the drone or the aircraft, um, that may not be feasible you know, and it may not, you may not need that for 70% of the work you're going to do. So, you know, as you look at these, it's really important to understand what your, your, your data requirements going to be, which, what product you're actually trying to generate, and then try to scale your system down to, to a system that you're going to use 90% of the time. Because that other 10%, I'm sure you can find rentals, you can partner, you can find other, other ways to get that data. Um, but from a sheer business standpoint, uh, you want to keep that sensor employed as much as you can so that you actually pr produce a profit for your company. And, and that's what we're dealing with here. And then I close with, as these sensors go with more higher fidelity, they get heavier. So as a case in point, that Bucks 1HA on the bottom of an M600, it can do it. You're not getting any cameras on that you're getting 10 minutes of flight time. And so that return on investment or that potential return on investment is very small for the amount of price that you're paying for that sensor. Uh, you know, at Bucks One HA, you wanna fly as far as you can uh, or as much as you can in the air so you get as much capture because that's where you make your profit. All right. So when we look at the selection for the drone, I kind of put a chart together here and great, we have <laughs> a little bit of overlap. I, I apologize for that. Uh, so going around the horn here, when we look at this, um, you know, I gave you 10 criteria to kind of help as a guide because it is kind of complex when you, when you look at what you can do. And a lot of folks, like today, I have a, I had a client that was um, wanting to go to, he's, he's from South Africa and he wants to cover large amounts of area. And so one of the things he said was, can we put this on a fixed wing aircraft? And, you know, that's, that's a very common question, but then I went back to, well, okay, what data, what's your data requirement? And, and so going back to that saying, when I, when I talk about data requirements, I'm really looking for, you know, what relative resolution do I need? And then what point density am I looking for? So those are the two key factors because that's going to tell me, how much of an image uh, I'm going to get. In case in point, um, a lot of the LiDAR targets that I use, you know, are not photogrammetry targets. They're, they're roughly four feet by four feet with a two foot white and a two foot black um, conflicting or um, uh, yeah, differential. Um, and I need that size because a lot of these sensors don't if I'm flying too high, are not going to have enough points per meter squared, even though you're hearing that I'm getting 200 or 800,000 points, um, I still don't get enough resolution for some of the software that I use to, to pick out that feature. Um, another case in point, if I'm dealing with vegetation, um, I may need, depending on the abetos of the plant, the amount of leaf area aperture index, so that's the, the size of the leaf and how tight it's actually packed, I may need more energy so that I statistically have more probability of getting returns underneath the plant vegetation. Um, so that's what I'm talking about for the data requirement. You know, and then the next thing I'm gonna think about 
is step two here, and that is the terrain relief. And when we look at that, if everybody remembers the, the comparative LiDAR chart that I gave you, you know, when you're looking at, let's say, a Velodyne product that has a max range of, of 80 meters, um, you know, so that's not 80 meters straight down, that's 80 meters sideways on your slant. So that means that really the amount of relief I'm able to measure, um, you know, really is only 30 or 40 meters. So if I have a, a high terrain relief that I'm dealing with here, either I'm going to have to pick a different sensor or I'm going to have to pick software and, and, a, and an aircraft that's able to, to adjust to that terrain. And we do do that. Um, we use different types of onboard lighter sensors to detect the terrain so that we can follow it. And we also use software that, that loads um, off of a geo server. And so I have detailed information that helps me predict um, what that terrain is going to be so that I can maximize my flight profile so that I can capture. So I would say that in a case where I'm dealing with high relief, like say very, very mountainous, um, you know, either I'm going to have to fly really high with a really powerful sensor, or I'm going to have to fly low with a very agile aircraft that can, that can do that and do it smoothly. Um, you know, where in the case of uh, flatland, I could have a, uh, I could use a fixed wing and it really wouldn't matter. Um, so, yeah, so that's where the relief actually matters. Now, the next area is coverage area. And so we, we did talk quite a bit in the other lecture or the other section of this. Um, you know, so part of this would be, you know, and this is where that fixed wing versus rotary come into, into play here. And I'll have a slide here in a minute to show you this. But how long can I stay in the air? And... Um, you know, how long can I actually stay in the air is really important, um, you know, versus the point density that I'm trying to do. So obviously a fixed wing aircraft is going to be, it's going to stay up a lot longer, but the problem is I'm not going to get the point density that, that I would. And so if I have a high point density requirement from step one, I may not be able to use an aircraft. And I'll show you that here in a few seconds. Um, so it may be that I will want to use a helicopter or um, a drone helicopter because it, its uh, lip to weight ratio is, is better. Or I may want to use a rotary copter because its agility is better, um, but now I have a battery. And maybe I'm looking at the battery and said, well, maybe I wanted to use a, a hybrid engine um, or gas if I'm illegal to do it in the area that I'm at. Um, then the next thing I, I briefly touched on is vegetation. So, you know, vegetation, this is the sole reason why you use LiDAR in the first place instead of photogrammetry. So when I'm looking at vegetation, the first thing I'm looking at is the height. So is that height going to obscure or prevent me from actually using the sensor of choice? Uh, case in being uh, with a Velodyne, you know, if the trees are 180 feet, uh, that doesn't give me a lot of margin to actually work with. <clears throat> We've done it, but I mean, it gets sporty <laughs> at the top of the treetops. And I've lost, well, not me personally, but my clients have lost more drones to trees than anything else. The next thing is the vegetation density. Um, the denser the vegetation, the, the more point density that I'm going to need to do, hence the lower and slower I'm going to have to go. So that's going to drive whether it's going to be a fixed wing, a helicopter, or a rotary. And then we briefly touched again on leaf area index, which is kind of the same thing as density, um, except now we're looking at how dense the plant is and how, how well light's going to get through. Um, most people look at leaf area index as something that LIDAR measures. Very few people look and try to find leaf area index to figure out how much ground they're going to get. So this is kind of a reverse of what you normally see in geospatial science, um, but something we, we factor in quite heavily. Um, endurance, again, we came back to that, and that really is kind of a function of, of coverage area, but again, the longer I can stay in the air, that means the more area that I can actually cover and the more profit that I'm actually able to do. Um, so that's why endurance is, is really important. So if you're doing small projects with small coverage areas, a, a small little drone will do it. But if you're trying to map at scale, then you need to look at 
um, something that has longer legs, whether it's fixed wing, doesn't take as much energy, or a, a multi-rotor that, that has maybe an alternative power source. And then we touched briefly on the slide before on lift capacity, um, you know, and this is huge, <laughs> no pun intended, but, uh, you know, as, as the demand for more data increases, as, as like my data analysts are always driving me to get richer point clouds, higher densities, more accuracy, uh, and, you know, that drives, that drives to bigger equipment. So, um, so therefore it drives for drones that are more capable. Now, mind you, the whole market is moving to smaller platforms, but not fast enough for the demand uh, for, for higher, higher accuracy, higher, uh, higher fidelity uh, data. So there'll always be a bigger demand for, for the high-end data than there actually is a capacity to get it. Um, at least that's what I've been seeing in the last five years. Um, and briefly, I'll touch on safety, you know, that you know, depending on where you're gonna operate, um, you know, what safety features and what redundancies are you going to have in your drone? Uh, are you going to have additional navigation? Are you going to have parachutes? Um, you know, just a slew of other things. Are you going to have um, obstacle avoidance lights so that you're not a risk at the end of a runway? Um, yeah, so that's a huge consideration. And, you know, the big thing with this is like when we work with um, like some of the DOTs, they actually have ordinance or regulations on how we can actually fly and it has to be, you know, and it has everything to do to, to actually satisfy a lawyer on, on the amount of liability that we're actually introducing. You know, a, a small drone like a, a Phantom poses very little risk to, to public safety. I mean, you're talking abrasions. Um, some of the larger aircrafts that we have are like 30 to, to 40 pounds before sensor. Um, you know, if, if we were to hit somebody with that, you know, we would actually have a fatality. So, you know, that understanding, you know, that what kind of safety features you're gonna put on it uh, is huge when you're selecting for the particular use case that you're going for. And, you know, and the other thing for that is, as we're talking about, part of it is you, you don't wanna crash your aircraft and you don't wanna hurt people and that's, that's job one. The other part of that is to your company, you know, and if you're flying around a $250,000 sensor and two phase one cameras at 100,000, uh, that's a lot of money. So, you know, trying to not lose your drone or if you're gonna lose your drone, not lose the sensor is also part of that safety profile as much as we hate to say that. Um, let's see here. So automation is important, um, mostly just because when you're dealing with this, if you're trying to fly LiDAR by hand, and, and this is something we cover in our course, you know, we teach courses um, that well, in that course, we're, we're always showing them how, you know, that the, the INS solution that you're dealing with um, is going to, to drive the accuracy of your product. And so the more that you're actually making manual inputs, the more error you're actually introducing and the less, uh, less desirable that data is going to be there for you. Um, and then nine, we have regulation. And I think that goes without saying that, you know, you want things that are compliant. And so part of that is like, for instance, we talked about safety flight over people. If you're applying for that kind of waiver, what's going on in the market today is, okay, what safety features are you having that are not going to cause a fatality? That's what the FAA cares about. Uh, the online site, you know, how are you going to prevent losing or putting yourself into a lost calm situation where, again, you could end up hurting people. And that's really what that comes down to or crashing the aircraft. And then for us, you know, when we're trying to put a box and two phase ones onto it, onto a drone, can we stay under the weight restrictions again so that we don't crash into somebody and kill them? So that's that's that regulatory component. And the last, which is kind of obscured, and I apologize for, apologize for that, is, is the ease of integration. Um, a lot of the things in the US market, you know, these are these are separate from the drone. So you know, that, therefore you can put them on a car, you can put them on a boat, you can put them on a backpack um, and you get more value out of that. But with that, how well does that actually integrate to the platform that you're using? Is it easy to load? Is the, is the software easy to use? You know, does it actually uh, help you in actually getting collection um, and, and actually performing work? And so I've seen a lot of different solutions to, to solving an integration problem from all in one to separate, um, you know, and some of them I, I would say were easy and some of them were not. And 
you know, that's something you'll have to look at. Um, so if you're going to change configurations all the time, you know, you may, you may want an all in one. And if you are going to have the same configuration all the time, then, then anything will probably do. But yeah, it's something that you'll have to look at, um, you know, when you're actually doing a purchase. All right. So here's a summary, just kind of, um, as we talked about the different platforms from a holistic, now we're gonna kind of narrow down. And so what we have here, you have multi-rotor helicopter, vertical takeoff and fixed wing. And so to just kind of sum up, you know, briefly, and you can have the slides to look at later, um, you know, really we, we're in two basic camps right now. Um, you know, we have the, the rotary aircraft, mostly in the multi-rotor multi realm, and then we have the fixed wing. And again, it goes back to the data that you're trying to capture. Um, so if you are trying to get high fidelity, uh, really accurate point clouds, you're going to want to look at some kind of rotor craft. Um, if you are trying to do fixed wing, or if you want to cover large areas, then you want to do fixed wing. And the trade-off is that because of the nature of the aircraft, it can't slow down slow enough to, to get the same thing that you can get with a rotor craft. Um, so, you know, if you only need, like, let's say a lighter quality one, so that's eight points per, per meter, then a fixed wing aircraft is probably just fine. And, and that's, you know, for the, the lighter that most people are used to, that's great. But when you're starting to get into, you know, looking at geomorphology and slides and, um, you know, the, the use case I'll show you here in a few minutes with the uh, gas oil where we're seeing rock slides or watching the earth actually move and trying to predict when we're going to have to do a repair, then we're starting to have to, to justify, you know, a more, more robust collection, which a drone would come into or a helicopter. Um, and then when you look at the difference between multi-rotor and helicopter, again, it really comes down to, you know, the, the high lift ratio. Um, you know, the trade-off would be that, uh, you know, when you're dealing with the, at least the drone helicopters, um, and I'm a helicopter pilot, by the way, uh, you know, even, you know, they have six foot steel um, rotor blades. They're a little intimidating here for me. They're, they're, I would consider them dangerous, um, but they do work. And so a lot of utility companies are using those because they are able to lift the heavy payloads. Um, where if you have something like a small job, you can see this is on an M200. So we're able to get, you know, 10 acres done. You know, we've got guys that are doing beach studies. They're jumping off a boat, fl uh, flying for about 10 minutes and they're moving on to the next site. Now I'm going to talk about here in the middle, everybody kind of looks at the VTOL as the, as the, um, as the solution. And I'd say, you know, it's a great trade-off, but really it's a fixed wing aircraft that takes off vertically. So you don't get the advantage of the high fidelity point clouds. If, if that's what you're trying to achieve, you just get to land in a very small area because with a VTOL, you know, it will take off, but um, you're not able to really slow down into a hover for any substantial part of time where that would actually be effective for you. So if you're dealing with folks that are saying, hey, we're going to do VTOL, we're trying to do this high accuracy uh, data collection, yeah, you may want to wave a white flag because that's actually kind of a misunderstanding of what, what a VTOL actually does. A VTOL would actually allow you to take off in a very small area and then cover a large area at, let's say, a quality level one. All right. So with this, I just wanted to show you, uh, by the way, this is uh, VUX1 data, uh, single pass. And um, I think this was done at uh, 50 meters. So we were doing some rail line work, um, or my client was. Um, but here, I'm, I'm going to show you this point density chart. And what I've tried to depict here for this is HGL 32 is when you look at these charts, you know, what you're going to see is there's a trade-off between how fast you go and how high you are. And that's going to drive what point density or what nominal point density or what your, how many points are actually going to hit the ground in theory. So that's what your sensor is going to put out or what it's actually going to see. This doesn't dictate what you're going to get back. <laughs> that's a totally different, that's a different part of physics there. Um, but what you can see here when we look at this is first off, if we look at the blue line versus the gray line, you know, which is, which is rotary versus fixed wing, you can see very quickly that because you can, because of the speed differential of what a fixed wing can do, look at how much different 
you know, we're going from 450 points roughly all the way down to 150 points. So again, and that's the amount of energy that's going to hit the ground, not the amount that's going to actually come back and be useful, measurable data. Um, so that's a pretty significant drop. The second point that we'll bring out here is the is the altitude or the height over terrain. So the lower you go, obviously the higher the higher the point density that you're actually going to achieve is going to be, or how tight it's going to be packed. Um, the problem here is, uh, or I think the difference would be that I can fly slower, so therefore I'm more agile, and I can fly lower to the ground with a with a rotary fixed wing drone, or I'm sorry, with a rotary drone. <laughs> it's going to be it's a late night tonight. Um, where with a fixed wing, I'm going to probably want to leave more room. Um, you know, as, as a low-level military pilot, yeah, it was great, but it was always very nerve-wracking to do a low-level route. I never knew um, if I hadn't done a really good chart study, I would have never really known, you know, where my obstacles were, and I, I didn't know where my pull-up points were if I was going to pull over a ridge or something like that. Um, the same is true of your drone. It's going to have a certain climb ratio and a certain response ratio. Um, you know, so that unless you're like really practicing and you're really, you're doing something unique, uh, probably flying a fixed wing drone is, is not the thing to do with a high uh, or a very expensive sensor. So therefore you're probably going to be, you know, somewhere around the, the 60 meters or the 50 meter realm. So you're even gonna have lower densities there. All right. So now to the good stuff. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about sample cases here. And try to tie this together here while we have a little time. And Karen, how I am? How am I doing for time? Can you guys hear me? Yes, I hear you. Yes. What time do you have right now? It's uh, six uh, seven fifty-seven Eastern. Okay. Okay, we're a little over. Gotcha. Five twenty-eight Afghanistan. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right here we go all right so first thing i'm going to kind of start to outlay a little bit of a, a formula here so we'll talk about the industry i'll try to lay out the problem for the data that you're going to see i'm going to tell you about the product they're trying to deliver so this isn't the lighter product this is the actual what they were trying to get from the data product so that was the use case i'll tell you the drone sensor uh, and we'll go a little bit through flight requirement, point density, and maybe some other planning factors that went along with it. Um, we got quite a few of these, so let's see how we can get through these. So first area that, or industry we're gonna look at was transportation. Um, and so this study was done in Virginia, in Manassas. Um, this was a experimental comparison. So they already had other mapping. So they had mobile mapping on here. Um, and what we're seeing, though, is inside the Department of Transportation across the U.S. here is the need for reaching beyond um, beyond the berm. So if you're using mobile, you'll you'll get to the rails, and you may see past it, but if anything is dropping off, you're going to get a data void because of shadow. And so what they wanted to see here was, first off, how fast would it be? And, and they wanted the data well past so like if we were looking at this can everyone see my mouse um, yep. so down here like in this this farmer's field they wanted to be able to know what the erosion was going to be so when they came in to set up their construction barriers they could actually put fencing where it needed to be and 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 be compliant um you know that was one of the cases the other thing they wanted was to get into this tree line because they potentially had to cut cut and fill back in here and so they really wanted to top top you down, but obviously this area was less than 20 acres. Um, so it really wasn't worth, you know, driving or commanding a, a helicopter to come in and do this at, at $30,000 to $40,000 a day. Um, so we brought in a, a Velodyne 16 um, and, uh, and performed this. It took us, it actually took us longer to set up the control than it was to do the flight. Um, we used only two control points for this one, mostly because um, that's what the client wanted. Um, and we got ourselves somewhere about five centimeters of accuracy. 
which wasn't bad. It's kind of, I, I would have preferred to have more checkpoints, but you know, you, you deal with what the clients, what you have. Um, I think the interesting thing about this was, you know, how we did the collection. I mean, we had to, if I tell the story about this, we had this huge knoll right here. And so it was really hard to get visuals on the whole, whole site. So we had to fly it in such a way that, you know, we flew down it and captured this road. And then I had to climb all the way up to 400 feet so I could maintain visual and then drop back down. Um, in this particular case, it was uh, early morning, so there was not much traffic. So we've actually flew down the center of the road um, and then back around and to get this piece because they were going to do a huge cut and fill back in here. Um, interesting, what you don't see in here is there was a huge um, radio tower sitting right here, which I really wasn't worried about hitting. I was more worried about uh, frequency interference um, and what that might do to the drone. So before we got out here uh, or put the big drone up, you know, first vegetation was an issue. So we, what we ended up doing just to make sure that we were safe was to uh, fly what we call the sacrificial drone. So that was our, our $300 drone. Um, we kind of let it whiz around here really quickly to see, you know, if we had proper clearance before we brought out the larger sensor. Um, so with that, you know, this is the data that we actually acquired. And so typically Velodyne data tends to be fuzzy and that's what you're seeing here. Um, we purposely flew what was somewhat off leaf, but we still had a lot of conifers in here. And uh, as we move forward, and let's me move forward. Okay, so we ended up getting some fairly good line work. And so that's kind of what the product they wanted. They wanted to get some pretty good line work. They wanted to get within um, six inch contours. You know, they ended up getting more like one foot contours on this one, um, you know, based on what we were able to supply. Um, let's see here. But the big thing is, you know, we were flying at, at 40 feet and we were getting some really nice profiles. Um, we got power lines. Uh, we've done other studies where they have not shown up. And again, remember I showed you the chart, um, the higher or the lower you fly, the more fidelity you can get. And so part of what I'm going to show you here is, yeah, we're 40 feet and we got a nice crosshatch of this, even though it, it's fuzzy. Um, but you can see out here where I didn't fly, you know, where we're out around um, 60, 70 meters, uh, you know, that, that, that fidelity drops off. And so you want to, if you're going to capture this feature, you're going to want to fly low and, and pretty center mass. Um, so that was one of the big learning points in this case study. And then of course we got berm to berm and that was pretty clear on here. So for Velodyne data, again, pretty good sampling um, of what you can get for a use case. I mean, a lot of folks that are used to LIDAR will look at this and go, oh, this is ugly. Um, but if you're looking at it from a statistical point and you're looking at it for what they needed to achieve, um, it, it was pretty good. They were really impressed, you know, even if we didn't get the contour level that we wanted. All right, and then we did some volumetrics and they were pretty happy with that. Um, and then here's kind of a side view. It's you can see, you know, that we, we got under the vegetation pretty well. Um, we didn't really have a lot of data voids, you know, even with the, the conifers and stuff like that, we had really good coverage. So this is what we're talking about with that vegetation. Um, you know, part of it's gonna be how dense that vegetation is. And then part of it is, you know, what kind of leaf you're actually dealing with here because both are going to drive how much you're going to get through. So I can have really thick leaf, but if they're widely spread out, widely spread out um, I should have enough to actually get under from the side. Um, where if they're really dense, but there's not a lot of leaf coverage, I can get it from the top. So that's vegetation penetration. Now, just, just to throw in an example, this is uh, Regal data. So this is the mini bucks. Uh, this was done for the Washington uh, Department of Transportation as an experiment. Um, this we got um, a resolution or a, yeah, it was a tenth of a foot resolution. And so we were getting six foot contours on this one. And again, they wanted to see the berm from side to side, but I'm really showing you this more to show you the difference in the, in the data fidelity. This was done at, at 50 meters. So this swath was, um, was 100 meters wide. And so you can cover a lot more area that way, um, but you can also see 
you know, we obviously got the distribution uh, lines. You can see it across the top over here, going across the, um, and then the other big difference that I didn't mention earlier, but I think this shows it very clearly is look how clear the road markings are. Um, this is a, usually a really good indication of, of the intensity scale or how, how it measures the reflected light to you. So Regal is known along with Optech as having really good um, intensity scales. And so when you're processing your data later, um, this helps you pick out features and make sure your classifications are done right. Um, so that I just gave this to you as an example or a cross. Okay, so now talking about infrastructure. So this was a, a bridge done in Japan. And, and the case in point here, again, rotary, by the way, I'm not gonna be able to show you any fixed wing. Um, but this one was done um, mostly, if you look at the terrain, and you know, I lived in Japan for eight years. So these hills are, are really steep. Um, so you go to try to survey these, you know, it's gonna take you weeks to go up and down if you can get there at all. I mean, we got a sheer drop off over here. Um, but oddly enough, when we did this, this is one of the first projects we did roughly about four years ago when we were first started to build sensors. And, um, you know, it was just an experiment. They did it one pass. They, you know, knowing what I know now, they did it completely incorrect. <laughs> and, and yet they got great data. They did it in 12 minutes um, without a control point. Um, and so what we get here, you know, we get this really good uh, bridge what a lot of people are looking for. We got underneath the vegetation for the, um, uh, for the roads. So they were able to strip the roads uh, and they were able to even get the hillsides a little dark on this one, but we were able to extract really good, strong contours on just one pass. Um, now, mind you, they really should have done probably two passes, one each direction and then a cross pass um, so that they wouldn't have any voids because there's probably some data voids in here. But when you look at it, 12 minutes to cover, you know, roughly about 10 acres uh, and get a bridge structure that would take them days to complete. And it's pretty amazing. Um, so this is a case where you'd want to use, uh, use a drum mostly because of the terrain. Um, you probably wouldn't, being a helicopter pilot, you wouldn't want to fly really close to these hills based on the wind. Uh, normally if I was doing a helicopter, I would have to have a more powerful sensor and stand off quite a bit. Uh, for something like this. But here, you know, they were flying, again, I think it was at 50 meters, maybe 40 meters, um, and we were able to get some really great results. All right. All right, forensic. So we're back to a VLP-16. In this particular case, we threw this on the M200. And so what they were trying to do here, this was a National Science Foundation uh, study uh, done in conjunction with um, the Kansas Bureau of Investigation, and this was also Kansas State Polytechnical for their UAS program. So, and this was done uh, on the uh, small UAS range in Kansas. And what we were trying to achieve here was, um, or what we're trying to do is see if this technology uh, would pick up small features. So this was done where we did, uh, so we were talking about the GeoQ uh, Loki system. So we used the GeoQ Loki system um, both day and night and did photogrammetry. Um, the photogrammetry we did at night, we had a, a huge spotlight above the drone to, to illuminate the surface, take pictures and keep moving. It didn't work well, but it was interesting. Um, and then we had uh, five, um, what do you call it, terrestrial sensors. So we had five lighter sensors as well. So that was the Kansas Bureau, Bureau of Investigation had brought their forensic teams uh, so they were using Laika, I think, uh, uh, CL20s, I think they were, um, you know, for their stations. And then, you know, then we had the uh, Velodyne 16 data. And um, again, the goal was to see if we could actually, in this particular case, recreate this crime scene down here. And they had uh, different scale bars of um, different size elements that we were going to see. So could we see the building? Could we see the terrain? could we see a, a gun shell that was roughly about three centimeters long by one centimeter wide? You know, and so how much features could we actually see and what kind of resolution could we find? Um, and then we had another crime scene down here in the vegetation. And uh, again, we we're trying to see what we could actually pick up inside that vegetation. 
Now, when I flew these, we flew them at uh, 18 meters. So we were actually below this 20 meter threshold and then 36 meters um, <clears throat> for all, all the data sets. And it took us roughly about for this one, uh, one acre parcel, which we found out later was actually too small for capture. We actually had to capture larger. Um, it took us about seven minutes to capture where it took the forensic team uh, roughly about two and a half hours to capture uh, the same thing. All right, but however, what we, what we found here, when we look at this data, which is probably in some of the best Velodyne data I've seen, what we've circled here, these are the actual registration bars that we were using uh, on the ground. And I think we had one over here for our, our vertical um, that we're using to tie all this data in. And um, what we found is it was really good at capturing the large gross features uh, you know, that were a greater than five centimeters. Um, and mostly because of the point density that we were having to deal with. Um, but, uh, you know, so we could, we could get the large features, but we did not get the resolution that was required for, let's say, some really precise forensics. And so hopefully next year, the year after, we'll take a, uh, we'll take a full box, which has the precision that we're looking for. But what I'll leave you with is, you know, if you're doing like say, uh, archeology, span historic preservation, uh, anything like that, where you're trying to, to find that, that, trying to find artifacts, uh, really knowing what scale that you're gonna have to deal with and what, you know, how much change management are you gonna have to look for is really important when you're trying to, to pick out the sensor that you're dealing with here. So, you know, at the end of this, we looked at this and went, wow, this is beautiful data, but it did not actually generate the, um, the, the resolution that we needed uh, to find some of these smaller objects that we're looking for. Um, however, and I didn't throw it in there and I apologize. Um, Karen, remind me, I'll send some pictures of this data through the vegetation penetration. Um, for a VLP 16 with two returns, we were able to get through the vegetation really well, um, which was pretty impressive for that kind of sensor. So. I'll make sure I send everybody uh, a copy or some pictures of that because uh, it's important to see what you can do with a lower end sensor. Oh yeah, here was a horizontal bar right over here. Okay. And so now we're getting into a little bit of vegetation management. So here we actually have a full box. Um, what's happening here is, um, and this is interesting across the utilities. So a lot of utilities are using LiDAR. Um, this is actually distribution line. And why this is important is if anybody's from California or I think up in Anchorage even, you had uh, my grand or my father-in-law lives on the Kenai and you have those big burns that are going on right now. And so right now, everybody's really concerned about um, burn fuel and, uh, and, and burn ladder. So what we're looking at here wasn't so much you know, the, the power lines, even though we, we did map that, we were looking to see how much of the, the baseline vegetation we could actually see. Um, so we were using a drone because we could fly a lot slower. And so this is a hybrid um, with a Vux on here. Uh, it flies about two and a half hours. So we were able to, we were more limited by how fast we could keep up with it and keep it in sight than we were, um, you know, the, the actual duration that we had to stay, stay up. Um, Again, this was colorized. So what you see here, we do this comparison. So this is what we call a fall hazard analysis on distribution line, um, which is something that's really underrated right now. Everyone's focused on the transmission lines, uh, but a lot of the distribution lines are also in neglect with the amount of vegetation that's grown up around them. So this is one of the products that our, our partners data site are, are working on. And then we have here, what we've done is we've actually stripped off the vegetation. So we've stripped up all these trees here. Um, and so what you're looking at here is uh, third, fourth and fifth returns mostly. Uh, but this is all the, the dead brush and ladder material underneath. And so we are using the lighter to actually assess this material and measure it and to see what kind of burn risk we're actually dealing with. Um, so this is where you'd want really, really high fidelity and really, really high point density so that we A, get through the vegetation, but then we're also able to quantitize and quantitatively measure this, uh, this material down here. 
and provide a risk analysis. Okay, so, you know, just to kind of sum up, you know, we went through a lot of stuff really fast and it always seems to be the sense of everything that I give here because there's just so much to learn on this material. Uh, but, you know, hopefully I left you with that there's a lot of options and, you know, everybody in my world, everybody gets excited about using a drone. Uh, that's not always, and, and for most cases still until regulations change, it's not always the, the most efficient model. But where you will use LiDAR on a drone is when you have hard to reach, hard to access places, or you need to move really slow um, so you get the high fidelity that you're looking for. Um, the other thing to do if it's a really small area and, and it's, it's LiDAR on demand, so to speak. So if you've got a job site that you have to hit over and over and over again, that's when the drone becomes efficient and cost effective. Um, so with the second portion of this, I want to leave you with that, uh, you know, every LiDAR project, you know, really has to start with the data requirements. Uh, if, if you don't start there, uh, you're not going to get the cost savings that you're really going to be looking for. And then, you know, finally, you know, for drones here, for the current drones being used, they're really using for high definition point clouds in a small area. That's where you want to use that. And I think in every case that we showed you here, uh, that's what we were dealing with. So that concludes my portion. Um, kind of gone over a little bit, but do you guys have any questions? All right, any other questions? Great question, by the way. Uh, Dan, this is Steve. You touched on something near and dear to my heart, and that is how you used uh, DTED data for your uh, your flight planning. And I was curious, what level of DTED are you using? Uh, shoot, right now, um, so I just got off the phone with Esri, and so we're looking at how we can use some of the stuff in their inventory or, you know, how to collaborate to get higher resolution. But right now in the drone market, um, you know, all we're using is Google Earth, which is sometimes good enough um, and sometimes not. So the other thing that we do when, when the terrain is, let's say, suspect, is we'll fly uh, photogrammetry first. We'll turn that into... Um, digital raster, elevation raster, and then we'll load that into our flight profile. Um, so that's really good in, in mining rock quarries and that kind of stuff um, where they, you know, where I'm, I'm not confident of, of the uh, what's being reported. But I would say right now, 90% of what we have is, is, is Google Maps, which isn't great, um, but it gives me a, a point to leap off of, if that makes sense. It does. Uh, my path is uh, I'm currently using 30 meter uh, DTED 2, but I got uh, DTED 3 for my final project in LIDAR, and I would like to keep going to DTED 5 as a way to improve radar performance in the high relief terrain. And uh, I've done everything except actually test it, so <laughs> I, would, I would like to get to 5. Gotcha. Gotcha. But the radar the radar people are working with me, so I hope, I hope we can get there someday. Just curious what you were using. Yeah, I'd, I'd rather have synthetic than lighter for that kind of stuff as well. <laughs> I'm looking at, there's some people, you know, I, I, that was a little, uh, I forgot to publish the discussion for the questions that the students posted after the reading. Okay. So I did that earlier today and we did get some questions and I can share my screen Sure. Let me turn this one off. I, I can get. I can do it. There you go. Okay. So, just to see. So Warren was asking. I work with expensive physics-based software that could simulate a UAS collection. Is there anything readily available? Simulation software for someone to simulate a flight, optimize a collection plan, and do you have any recommendations? Yeah. So I use. Um, so I'm a, a partner with something called Universal Ground Control Station. Uh, they're out of Lithuania. Um, and uh, if you look at theirs, so they do have a simulator. Um, most, again, most of the market, I would say 90% of the market is focused on photogrammetry. So guess what? So are they. So I'm not getting visual cueing bars or, or any of the whiz-bang things that I would like to see uh, they would show me my, my, like my LIDAR coverage. Um, that I have to do solely by math. But I would say that um, 
as far as being able to plan a mission in three dimensions um, and uh, and be able to run an emulator to, to show what that mission is going to look like. Um, yeah, I, I like Universal Ground Control Station. And if anybody wants a free trial of that, uh, send tell Karen, she, I'll get back to you and I can get you a 14 day free trial. Right. They have also, they have your, in your introduction, in the introduction piece, you know, your little bio. Oh your yeah. Your email link is there. So they have, a, they do have a way of contacting you. Okay. Yeah. Email me direct and I can get you a free trial of that. And then um, I can get you discounted rates. If that's your calling, that's not a sales pitch. You know, I don't care. Um, just that's an opportunity. Okay, so Danae asked, what is the average line of sight distance the operator must be within to fly the UAS? Are there antennas the operator will use to improve that range? And I'm interested in the ground <laughs> component. It looks like a typical SUAS was flown with a simple handset. What components are in the quality assurance data elements the operator receives and how many alternate data links are typically available on the platform to downlink information back to the operator? Awesome. All right. Let's just tear this one apart. Uh, so average line of sight distance really is dependent upon the terrain, the amount of aerosols in the air, um, you know, and then the amount of light and reflectivity off of the drone. Um, you know, regulation says that you have to keep it within visibility of the naked eye. Uh, so what do we do to do that? Um, first off, uh, I put, I mean, I have a disco ball on mine. It, uh, you know, I have reflective tape. Um, I have basically aviation uh, strobe lights that are on mine. And so I may not actually be able to, let's say, distinguish that that's my drone, but I know that's my disco ball. And so I'm still within, <laughs> within the legal guidelines of the FAA. So that gets me, if I have a, a really good day, um, so let's say I would say in the evening, uh, before I have dew, um, with the sun going down my back, my back to the sun, I can get about two miles on those uh, two statute miles of, of range, um, you know, on that. And that, that's something that we've measured and tested. Um, but that's about the best I can do in the best condition. Um, you know, and when you look at some of the beyond line of sight waivers out there that say, hey, we got 30 miles. But if you look at the small small clause, they only limit you to three statute miles, both because of the antenna questions you have and also because they do want you to remain somewhat in line of sight at some point in the flight. Um, are there antennas the operators can do to improve range? Absolutely. Um, if you are buying in the commercial market, you are very limited. Uh, if you are buying something more custom, like you came to us you know, specifically and said, I have this range requirement, uh, first off, we'd probably get you a ham operator license, uh, but then we, there's other frequencies that we could use. We can change the shape of the antenna. So the reaper pilot should know that's when you're going from omni to, to other, uh, other sensors, um, you know, and then like for instance, if we had um, Great Eagle, you know, we actually have an antenna tracker uh, that we can use as well. And so that way that antenna would actually follow with you now, the, the risk here with that is if you break lock with the antenna tracker. So, but with that, you know, if you, if you had an antenna tracker and you had it elevated, you can get an, an incredible amount of range. And so some of the products that we sell for the Navy, you know, we're getting 50 miles range with a small UAS. Um, so it, it's just a matter of power, the, the shape of the antenna, and, uh, and, and how high you are. Let's see. Interested in the ground component, looking for a small UIS flown on a simple handset. Um, yeah, if you're dealing with, with simple handsets, that, that really limits you because there's now you're still within you know the 2.4 gigahertz, 5.8 uh, Wi Fi FCC regulations, so there's not much you can do there. You boost the signal, you're going to take out grandma's Wi Fi, uh, and they don't like that, and you may take out a few traffic lights too. Okay, let's see what Daniel says here. Small amount of experience with terrestrial. Okay, I got the Pharaoh, great sensor. Uh, use these to map 
and document historical structures of digital heritage. Okay. Um, I'm wondering what similar results you could achieve for small airborne drones carrying lighter instruments flying the flying around the interior of the buildings. I'm wondering if you've ever heard of such an application in drone tech. Um, okay, and a feeling for efficiency of mapping the interior of structures. Okay, so for your question, Daniel, so first off, we, we did cover a little bit of that in the, uh, the forensic and a little bit of the heritage or the uh, archeology. span It depends again on the level of detail that you're going to want to have. So if you looked at um, no, I'm not sharing my screen anymore. If you looked at the, the pyramids, I mean, you could make out they were pyramids and they were decent, but it really wasn't truly dense enough to, to like, like you would see with a terrestrial scanner. And that's what in this lecture I talked about that if you need the really, really high density and you need the micro measurements, you're still going to be working with a terrestrial based sensor. Uh, we are looking at, <laughs> this is crazy, but we are looking at putting two uh, offset LIDAR onto a drone. So two uh, quantity, I believe it is, um, onto a drone that, uh, that can increase the density. But yeah, we're still a little bit away from there. Um, now with the internals, we are, there are products out there that can fly inside of particularly, um, we haven't done inside buildings, but inside of mine shafts. And uh, so there's some software packages that allow you to, instead of doing GPS type collection with LiDAR, they're allowing you to use uh, SLAM based. And so if anybody has any questions on that, um, I can refer you to some software that, that may work along with a, uh, a drone mapping system. So, um, but that's really a specialty case, even though we get asked about it from time to time. Okay. And pricing, wide range variables considered Yeah, I think the biggest thing here, Steve, when you look at the lessons learned here on pricing um, is really getting resolute on, on the data product that you're going to be producing. Uh, get some data samples with a vendor. Um, you, you, for me, like I said, you, you want to find the products that you're going to produce 90% of the time, and, that's the, uh, and then you start to shoot for the sensor that, that fits that. Um, you don't really want to overspend um, unless you, you think you got a really good sales team and a business development team that, that, that can crush it. Uh, I would rather, my, my thoughts and what I've learned over the last five years is I'd rather get a, a lesser sensor, get myself established, um, find all the use cases that I could pay that thing off in, in, in just a few months. And there's a lot of clients that, uh, out there, the engineering firms that know how to do business, they have client bases, they know where to find the contracts, and they use this sensor as augmentation to their business, they're paying this stuff off in six months or less. It's the guys that are going in um, that don't have a business case, uh, are, are fascinated by LIDAR, but they don't have the market experience yet. Those are the guys that struggle to, to pay off a sensor. Does that make sense? It does. Very good sense. Uh, we sit there for hours and chair fly how we would apply this thing to our own personal life. So <laughs> good, good insight. Yeah. It's, it's always a matter of who is going to pay you. And if somebody pays you, you can afford it. Now yep, that's why the military applications are a little bit more fun. <laughs> yeah. We're working with a couple teams on a few of those. It's, it's fun stuff. Yeah, this was on the Tiger Shark program we did for Navier. Oh, okay. Gotcha. 